my name is Sandy Golding and I'm president of Beaches Watch. For those of you who may not be familiar with Beaches Watch, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan citizens group, and uh, we are celebrating 10 years this year. And uh, we, at, we are focused on educating and engaging citizens on the issues that come before our local beaches communities. And uh, so tonight we're having a really very good meeting that's including all three beach communities. Um, should be very interesting, but before we get started, I want to recognize the elected officials we have here tonight. Uh, first of all, we have U.S. House Representative Amber Crenshaw. Thank you, we appreciate you being here. And his lovely assistant who comes here, Smith, don't want to leave you out as well. And then we also have uh, Mayor Charlie Latham from Jackson Beach. <laughs> One of our speakers is Mayor Harriet Pruitt from Neptune Beach. <laughs> and we also have Scott Wiley, from, uh, City Councilman from Neptune Beach. <laughs> any others that I'm missing. So I hope everybody picked up an agenda tonight. On the back of it has contact information for all of our local officials. So if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, this is uh, where you're going to be able to reach them. And then I want to run through a few things real quickly before we get started with our presentations. Um, there is no, on the agenda you'll see there is no Jackson City Council meeting Monday, July 7th. So I want people to know about that. Um, the Atlantic Beach Charter Review Committee is meeting twice in July. Sally, do you want to mention anything about that since you're on the Charter Review Committee? It's open to the public. Okay. Like their input. So can people talk at these meetings? Yes, they can speak up. Or send an email. Okay. All right. Let me welcome uh, Neptune Beach Councilor Kara Tucker, who just came in as well. Um, also, want to make everybody aware that the second Atlantic Beach Police Academy is looking for participants, and so there's information on the agenda here for that. It will be starting August 21st, and if it's anything like the Jacks Beach Police Academy, yes, sir? Uh, Jackson Beach Police Academy starts July 10th. There's still openings. Oh, there are still openings. If okay. Anybody's in there, see me at the end of the meeting. Okay, so please see Mr. John <coughs> Galarno after the meeting if you're interested. Thank you. Uh, just want to mention too that qualifying has ended and the the slate of candidates has been finalized. So we have the list here for Jacks Beach and Neptune Beach. For Jacks Beach, seat four, District One, we have Bruce Thomason and Fernando Meza, and then for seat six, District Three, we have. Three candidates, Lee Buck, John Galarno, and Lloyd Hyatt, and all of them are here tonight. Um, and because we have three candidates, we they will be on the uh, primary ballot August 26th, which means Beaches Watch is going to have a forum, and we're we're planning the forum for sometime in August. It'll be right before the primary. So. Jack's Beach voters in that district will have an opportunity to meet and hear those candidates before you vote August 26th. <coughs> then also the Neptune Beach candidates are Richard Arthur and Rory Diamond. So, um, and we will have, their election will be in November. So there will be a Beaches Watch candidate forum in October for the Neptune Beach candidates. And then we'll also have another Jack's Beach forum in, in October for the runoff for the candidates that were in the primary as well as the candidates that were not having to be in the primary, which will be Bruce Thomason and Fernando Meza. So, okay. And then just remind everybody about the 10-year anniversary celebration. Uh, Curtis, where did you go? Right here. Oh, there you are. Um, Curtis has some sponsorship information. Uh, we are looking for sponsors for the event because this is a big event and we're gonna we're gonna make it big. And so we're looking for sponsors to be part of it. Um, so we would love for you to talk to Curtis after the meeting. Uh, like I said, he's got some information. And um, yeah, I'll just be at the back. We'll okay. Okay, that would be great. And just remind everybody that you can always join Beaches Watch. It's ten dollars for an individual membership and fifteen for 
a family membership. And Eileen Krimsky, who's at the table, she's our membership chair, and she can take your membership fee. And uh, the membership is for the year, for like January to December. So if you pay now, it's good till the end of December. And then our next meeting is August 6th. Right now, we do not have a location, and we don't have the, the topic finalized, but we are working on that. So now, yes, ma'am. Uh, I'd like to announce the Jacksonville Task Force on Consolidated to Analyze Consolidated <coughs> Government. We have our final report done, and we will be presenting it at 10.30 in the morning on Monday, July 21st at Jacksonville City Hall. Okay, good. If anybody's interested, I'd love to see you there. Okay. Yes, ma'am. It's just, just the middle of the year. What's the benefit of, of joining membership now instead of waiting until January? Anyway, what kind of benefits as a member? Other than just giving you the it's, contribution. It's it's just Stop. basically it's <laughs> just to support. It's just supporting what we're doing because we you know we have forums that we're going to be doing and uh, several events that we're going to be doing. So it's just to, it's just basically yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So tonight we have. Um, three speakers that are going to be talking about our beaches budgets and because our budget process is getting started and uh, the beaches are going to be finalizing our budgets by the end of uh, September I believe, correct? So first of all we've got uh, Nelson Van Leer who is the acting city manager for Atlantic Beach. He's here tonight to talk about Atlantic Beach. We have Harry Pruitt from Neptune Beach who will be talking about Neptune Beach's budget process. And then we have George Forbes, who's the city manager for Jacksonville Beach, who will be talking about Jacksonville Beach's budget. So, and what we'll do is, um, let's go ahead and have each of them do their presentations, and then if we want, we can do questions afterwards, after all the presentations are done. So, Harry, would you like to go? Ladies first? I will. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Being a part of just watching. Um, our city manager, um, first of all, Jim could not be here tonight, he's out of town. And um, the city council has two, two people under us. We have our city manager and our city clerk, and that's what we call our staff. And then, of course, Jim Jarbo is the CEO of our city, and he has the whole rest of the city as his staff under him. And uh, um, I guess it's going to be different for me talking from, from the city managers themselves tonight. Um, because we're so small, I probably don't have as much to say. But anyway, the city manager, Jim, and his department heads, uh, they spend many hours working up figures and doing preliminary work, coming up with what is needed under their budgets. And it can be very tedious for Neptune Beach because we have so little revenue sources to work with, and we try to wait until the, uh, the revenue and add the more project projections are as accurate as possible when it comes to income and revenues for us to spend. Um, there's been a time or two when the ad valorem figures from the county ended up far less than projected. And when this happens, it leaves the finance department to scramble to make up the differences to balance and adjust the figures for us to maintain our current levels of service to our community. And um, with the little revenue that we receive to run the city and all the expenses that we incur, our staff uh, likes the most accurate projections possible for before finalizing the budget that's sent to us for us to look at. Uh, in Neptune Beach, business, uh, in Neptune Beach uh, we run basically uh, on a shoestring, a very tight shoestring. And after staff does their uh, work, um, then the proposed budget um, items are sent to council for our consideration and for any changes that we might want to see. And there's several times during the year that we usually have to amend the budgets as things come up. Most recently, I felt like the city clerk's uh, office needed to upgrade their decade-old um, recording system to digital. It was over uh, about 15 years old, and in order for us to help the city citizens and help uh, process the, the meetings and everything, the city clerk's uh, office, I felt like this was, this was really important, and the rest of the council supported it. So, um, in order for us to get the new equipment, uh, we had to amend the budget, and to me, that was a good thing. Uh, the latest property value figures that we received just last Friday gave us an increase of 41 percent, um, and that is about $80,000 more for the general fund in this projected budget. That's a good thing. Um, and that figure is not the final figure from the county uh, yet. 
At the lower property, taxes is net to the largest source of revenue. And as most of you know, it is the county itself that gets most of our tax dollars. Uh, we are hoping to keep the same village rate as last year, but until the budget package is complete and sent to the council, that's not a given. Um, like many small cities, Neptune Beach is facing revenue problems. Over the last six years, the city can consistently cut its cost to keep from having to raise taxes. And in the present budget, the general operating fund is $250,000 less than it, than it was seven years ago. We have had the philosophy in Neptune Beach of doing more with less. And each year it's become more difficult for us to continue the same level of service without raising taxes. We are looking forward to keeping the village at the same village rate as last year, 3.3756 per thousand of assessed value, if at all possible, and we're hoping that this will be possible. On a high note, our police uh, pension fund is more than 8% funded, which is considered a good position for us to be in a good financial uh, position by the experts. And then some of the issues that we have in the upcoming budget are, are uh, settling the animal control issue with the county government. Jacksonville and settling the tipping fee issue with the county government. Um, and finishing, we've got to finish Val Harbor sewage project, uh, starting a new project uh, in the 4th and 5th Street area, south of Florida Boulevard, for sewer paving and reconstruction, <coughs> and additional three miles of roads throughout the city. Also, we, we hope to rehab 20 crosswalk walks to the beach. Our crosswalks are getting in very bad shape, and we're looking to do that. Um, and as you can see, all these uh, present a major challenge for a small city like Neptune Beach, especially considering that we, again, have no outside boundaries uh, like utility revenue, like many cities do, leaving us with limited uh, revenue to accomplish our objectives. And additionally, we have uh, maintained the same level of service despite the fact that we have reduced staff by 70% over the past eight years. Um, we have uh, our first budget review on general fund uh, July the 22nd at 6 p.m. in our city hall chambers. And um, obviously with limited resources, the general fund budget would be the most challenging. Our general fu uh, fund budget consists of 4.4 million and uh, our total budget consists of 10.8 million. Um, our workshop on the utilities, which is the sewer and water and stormwater would take place in August, but we just haven't set the date on that yet. Um, that's about all I have to say at this point. Um, I will try to answer your questions at the end as best I can because at the end it's, it's the city manager of the staff that works at this budget and then presents it to the council. So right now I'm limited on, on, um, on the figures and things like that. I wish I had more to offer and I'm sorry Darla could be here but, but uh, he's out of town. Uh, he's getting ready to come and, and walk and ride up down 1st Street on July 4th and keep things under control. Yeah. <laughs> wanted to say a few things and and I understand that he can't stay very long so I wanted to give him if you don't mind uh, Nelson give you give you some some time if you wanted to speak okay. uh, I just want to give you all a quick update on a couple of things that are impacting our area in, in Congress and first I'd like to say it's encouraging we're out uh, for the 4th of July break so I'm home and, and that's why I want to come by here but it's encouraging to see so many people that care about communities and that are getting together and talking about things. When you talk about the budget, one thing that, that, that the federal government does uh, is help local communities in terms of beach renourishment. Uh, the three communities here are a part of a Duval County beach restoration, and it really goes from the jetties uh, down to St. John's County, about 10 miles, and includes Jacks, Neptune, and Atlantic. And I work with the Corps of Engineers, the federal agency, to provide 70% of the funds that go for the beach renourishment. And I think since I've been in Congress, we've spent about $23 million on beach renourishment up and down the coast here in my district. And we've got another project coming, uh, not next year, but in the 16 budget, uh, there'll be money uh, that the Corps will put in place for the next step. Uh, I remember, I think in Atlantic Beach, um, maybe the Neptune, but in 2009 we got an award. It was, it was the best beach nursing project uh, in the country. It was a group out of South Carolina that came down. We, I remember it was a hot summer day, but uh, it was kind of interesting to see that the work had been done so well. So that's going to happen. Uh, and I would say to the folks uh, on the budget side of everything, stay in touch with us. I see George 
Ford back there nodding his head. He's always looking for federal dollars. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think we had a stag grant back for Jackson uh, Beach. That was like 09, 010, about half a million dollars to do some, some uh, wastewater. Those are few and far between. So that's good news in terms of beach renourishment. Uh, just real quick, the other thing I wanted to mention is last week uh, we passed the Defense Appropriations Bill. Uh, I'm one of 15 members of Congress that sits on that, and we oversee and fund all the defense budget. Uh, and that includes, obviously, Mayport, uh, NES Jacks, Blunt Island, and everything else around the world. But the good news from the standpoint down here, uh, Mayport, as you know, I've been working to bring a nuclear carrier, and that's been delayed. We have to do two more projects uh, before the nuclear carrier can come. We did three of those. And then with the tight money, uh, those last two haven't been done. So I've worked with the Navy, uh, the Secretary of the Navy, the Chief of Naval Operations. They've been down here. They understand uh, that Mayport has an impact on the beaches community as well as Northeast Florida. And so they've made a real effort. We've, we've worked together to say, uh, to start with, uh, they're bringing what they call a amphibious readiness group. Uh, you might have read, in fact, I see some folks in the uh, audience that uh, back in December of last year, uh, we flew out on a Harrier out to the USS New York, which is one of the support ships, and rode into Mayport. And it's going to come uh, make its home, so the sailors and their families are going to be part of that. In about six weeks, uh, a ship called Iwo Jima, which is a big deck amphibious, it's, it's the main ship, it looks like an aircraft carrier, uh, but it's not. Uh, and it will come along with another support ship like the USS New York, it's called the USS Patrick McHenry. And so when those three ships are in Mayport, that means 2,000 sailors and their families are going to call Mayport home. Now that's obviously good for the national security uh, because this is a very strategic place, but it's, as you know, uh, it's important for the long-term economic viability of the beaches community when you've got 2,000 new folks and their families going to school, involved in the community doing those kind of things. And they're also, they're going to, if you read in the paper, there's something called the Littoral Combat Ship, the so-called LCS. That's the ship of the future. Uh, that's the ship the Navy's been working on. And all of those that come to the East Coast will be home ported right here at Maple. Uh, ultimately, there'll be maybe 25 or 26 ships. Uh, but this year, there was $20 million to build a train facility at Mayport. Uh, and then the ships are going to start coming, I think, in 2016. So that's good news, too, because you got more ships. Uh, that means more jobs. And the last thing I want to say is not only has the Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations been there a couple of times, but the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, a guy named Sean Stackley, he's in charge of everything the Navy does, whether you move ships, where you fix up ships, where you buy ships. And I've been working with him to make sure that they didn't decommission 11 of the cruisers because frankly, they had about 25 years of useful life left. And I said, why would you decommission them when you can modernize them? And actually, three of them are made for them. So that's been done. They're going to be modernized. That's good uh, because we need more ships. Quite frankly, I could talk a long time about how we don't have enough ships. But we're going to have those cruisers, uh, and, and that's good news. And uh, I, I guess that's kind of the, the main thing I want to say. The final would be all the work that's done at Mayport, not only do you have more sailors, but you got more ships, that means more ship repair, and as you may know, there's a community here in, this, in Northeast Florida that does ship repair, uh, and they're interested in seeing more ships because they're the ones that get to work on them to maintain them, fix them up, modernize them. And that's usually 75 to $100 million of business a year, and with these new ships coming, they'll have even more work to do. So they're, they're really excited about it. Uh, they've been through some tough times when there weren't as many ships there. So that's just kind of an update of what's happening in Washington. I appreciate you letting me kind of take the time, and good luck to everybody. Again, thank you. You know, I, I was born and raised here. I come down to the beach uh, a lot when I was a kid, and so you understand how important the beaches are in terms of tourism, in terms of everything, but also in terms of just beach nourishment. It's, it's a preservation protection, uh, and we get our fair share of federal dollars to make sure that we do that. And for me to represent the community where I was born and raised is, is a privilege. So thanks for giving me that. Thanks for what you do and for letting me say a quick word. Thanks, Andy. So, Nelson, would you like to go next? I'll see if you don't have it.
Um, you know, I was asked, by the way, for those of you that don't know who I am, I'm the interim city manager for the Beach. I've been doing this since the um, beginning of December. And uh, I've been the finance director for 16 years. And before that, I worked for nine years at Jack's Beach. I worked for George Forbes, helped him with his budget there. And I've also prepared budgets for um, Jarvo in my stretch as well. So, um, I want to give a little perspective about just the process of going through the budget. And um, I prepared this quickly, so if you see uh, mistakes or anything like that, and bear with me. It's kind of a quick page up there. So, so, like I said, I'd just like to kind of step you through from a technical standpoint of putting the budget together for, for, for the government. Probably it sounds like from the guys in the audience, most of you are probably familiar with it, but I'll with it anyway. Um, as a city manager, this is one of the most, if not the most important task that we're asked to do when we come to work for the city. Um, the budget document is uh, gives the city the authority to spend the money to raise the revenue to fund all the services with, and it allocates the resources between the departments and divisions, and we try to line those up with the priorities that uh, elected officials have, have tasked us with. Um, we use the budget as a tool. It's, it's a control device. It, it keeps politicians and elected officials that get elected from going crazy with all their ideas about all the things that they like to do when they get in the office. Um, kind of puts the brakes on and brings them down to reality. Uh, it is the taxpayer's money, so, so we uh, try to keep our arms around that. Um, and also, when you guys go to the monthly, or whatever the commission meetings are, usually there's a finance report once a month that will give you a budget to date figure. So every month, finance is uh, measuring our progress throughout the year in a way of how much of your budget have you spent, are the revenues coming in, you know, the way you expected them to, when you plan your budget, and then constantly monitoring that to make sure that you're on track so you don't run out of money before the end of the year comes. Um, it's also a way of measuring are you actually accomplishing the things that the taxpayers ask you to do with the funds. Uh, if you had a program, say a police academy, that you wanted to serve 100 citizens with, and three quarters of the way through the year you hadn't spent any money, and that shows up in the financial reports, citizens would be asking, well, why aren't you spending the money? Or, and vice versa, you might overspend the money, and then you slow it down. So. Um, in our city, we've adopted a budget policy. Um, what that does is kind of give a framework to build a budget around. Uh, we do a budget every year, but the elected officials come in and they don't really understand how much money it takes to run all the different departments of the city. They know about the big ones in the police and the fire, but they don't know about how much an IT department uses or the human resources department. So we set up a framework um, so that we go through and we construct a budget within that framework and then Take it from there. Some of the things in our budget policy that, that are the controls is that we, we promise to start each budget cycle with some sort of strategic planning. This year in transition, I shortened that to a, basically a pre budget meeting where I took all of the inputs from the department heads, put them together on a list, and went to have a public meeting and discuss with the commissioners um, ideas about what we'd like to see in the upcoming budget. Um, our budget is proposed generally based on um, what it takes to provide the current level of service and the current tax rate. Um, we promise that we're going to propose a balanced budget. And that sounds simple, but most people think that means that your revenue is equal to your expenditures. But technically, what it means is you take your, your total resources, your cash plus your revenues, and that will equal the expenses and your ending cash balance. And you have to take into account all of the restricted 
fund balance reserves uh, set aside so that you don't go into spending programming and spend those down as well. Um, we set aside 25% for three months operating expenditures and all of our major funds is a rainy day. We actually are better than that in the general fund. Um, we also have a policy to propose a budget that includes all of the positions funded. Say, for instance, you're getting through your year and you've had three or four vacancies and it looks like you're having a good year. Um, we wouldn't go and budget those same amounts to do that again. We will always gross up the budget and budget um, for the positions. It usually means because we also have turnover, but that's a place where we come in under the budget. Um, our commission passed a, a resolution some years back that uh, we would make every effort to fund at least a 3% raise for employees that were subject to available funds. Um, we went for a stretch of about five years without any raises, so we're, we're coming out of those, those years. We uh, our budget document would include 10 year projections that just make sure that, that you know, sometimes it's easy to balance this year's budget. But if you begin programs that are going to need to be funded into the future, you have to make sure that the revenues in the future will continue to, to match up with those expenditures over time. We also um, don't take pension holidays like that's a little bit accused of. It's our, if our actuary says, you know, this is how much you put in every year for our pension plans, that's what we budget. That's how we do that every year. Um, when you budget the capital items, we include that in the proposal for things that you need to provide the current level of service. Uh, we also have funding sources, grants, or better tax, discretionary tax and sales tax money sometimes that we don't have particular items for, and that's what we do with use of discretionary projects with those things. We would bring out the discretionary things in the uh, workshops and can be matched you know, different people have different priorities so you can get into a little bit of discussion about where you're going to spend this money you want. Um, you know, I think I've kind of covered a little bit of the, this process begins all the way back when elected officials come in. They, the new elected officials come in, they want to meet with staff, we sat down with all of them, they tell us what they want to see, what their goals were, what their campaign platform was. And, they have all these ideas, visions, missions, goals, of what, what they want to do in their term in office. And we try to take what resources we have and put together a budget to you know, line up with what they want. Um, you have, you know, if you have funding, um, is it worth doing? And do we have the right kind of people to do some of the things that they want to do? And one of the most important ones that's overlooked that a lot of times doesn't have anything to do with money is if they're asking us to do things that we just don't have time to do, or we just don't have enough people to do. So uh, it seems like we're always in a position of trying to hold them back and slow them down and keep them from what they want to do, but that's part of the problem. Um, we start the spring. Our department heads you know, have already been working on this quite a while. The, um, when we sit down with the department heads and, and they go through line by line every item in their, in their operation, we usually start with um, how they track with their current budgets for those things in this year as a basis for determining if it's enough for next year. And I think most, all of our three cities have been doing this for so many years that, that the Operating expenses and running day-to-day -day businesses, they, they don't change that much. So we can pretty much project how, how much money we're going to need to do the day-to-day -day operations. Um, we also want to make sure that the programs that we budget this year are successful, the revenue should continue to be this one, um, and make sure that the revenues are, are covered are there to support them. We also do the cash flow projections to make sure that we have enough cash for the major projects that sometimes take a number of years to save up the money that you're going to do if you're not borrowing them. Um, I some of that stuff. We do have in our reserve balances, like I said, we have 25% of 
an operating reserve. We also have cash that we can't spend um, because it's restricted for debt service returns. Uh, most of our funds, uh, other than the general fund, um, have restricted fund, fund balances for various reasons. Things that we use to put the budget together, like I said, current year's budget, state revenue estimates, these are going to be your sales taxes, communications taxes, gas taxes. Uh, these estimates just, just became available today. Um, they are posted on the website that we, I, I personally budget what the state says the estimate is. I don't know if Jack Beach does the same thing, but that's, that's a good way to do it. Uh, property tax value. Um, <coughs> from the property creditors office, revenue trends. Um, we have been experiencing in Atlantic Beach uh, a decline in water sales and revenues. You know, we always try to say that our revenues will keep up with expenses and we budget into the future as if there's going to be some growth and it seems like for the past seven or eight years it just hasn't been any. In fact, we've had some mobile home parks leave town and the revenues have gone down. So. Uh, increasing costs and less revenues. And we have been able to get a lot without having any rate increases. Um, we don't propose to have any rate increases this year for water, sewer, or sanitation, um, storm water, anything. And as far as the uh, property taxes, we also did the plan to get a budget with the existing budget as well. We're always looking and hopeful to get some grants. Um, also, when we, as far as resource, resources that we use, the, uh, from time to time in our utility systems, we have major plant upgrades that need to be done. We'll contract with um, engineers and they'll do what they call master plans, and they'll give us 10 or 15 years of future projects that we need to fund and let us know that we have to raise rates or, or go into debt. Um, We'll have those for water, sewer, and uh, you know, park semester plan and stormwater. Uh, we have debt service schedules that we have to program out for years. Uh, most of our utility debt is uh, 10 years left on it now. And in this year's proposed budget, it's going to be on the next couple of agendas on refinancing the major part of that, which is say it's about 130 to 140 a year. Million and a half over the next 10 years. We have union agreements that we got to comply with, pension reports, and then a large portion of our budget is predetermined through those contracts. Uh, in our case, we have uh, large contracts with sanitation service and the full fire service with the city of Jackson. Take all these resources and all this knowledge and input from the citizens and the commissioners. We're going to have um, our first uh, budget workshop meetings, other than the one that we had a few months ago, uh, you know, to uh, get some guidance in August. And they will then adopt the number of budget in September. Um, this is, in the current year, just to get some perspective on the side of the city of Atlanta Beach's budget. This is by fund types, our general fund, which is what most citizens know about, the square tax dollars and uh, this is police, fire, parks, and back streets. Um, ours is almost 11 million. This is revenues. Special revenues, we will have when your gas tax comes in, and some grants, um, police training funds, and uh, uh, convention development tax and things like that that are designated for specific purposes. Debt service fund shows zero. Um, that is for governmental debt. That's anything that's not having to do with our enterprise funds, which are the water sewer business type funds. Um, we made our last payment of our general debt this year. Capital projects fund, this is where we're going to do our major improvements that are not current level of service. These are projects that we would spend that have some sales tax money on to better tax money. Sometimes we'll spend uh, convention development tax money, or sometimes we'll spend general fund money if we have some excess reserves, and we will 
direct those sources to one place in the capital projects fund. This year we're probably going to look at funding our police building. There's, there's discussions about that going on now for five, six years. Hopefully something happen this year. Um, enterprise funds, 11.8 million in revenues. Again, that's water, sewer, storm water, sanitation, and our building department that does the building code enforcement. That's also an enterprise fund. So that's the total revenues. Uh, this is just a um, pie chart. Someone said the a pie chart. So um, <laughs> this is just of our general fund. So the uh, chart before, that was the entire city. This, this shows you here in, in this chart that, say, for instance, the 34% green is uh, how much of our general fund revenues are for our property taxes. One good thing about our cities here, unlike other cities across the country, is we have a diverse mix of revenues. So some cities are totally dependent on one source of revenue, and if something happens and it goes away, then their city can really suffer, but since we have a mix uh, of resources, then we're protected from that happening from us. This is the spin side of the uh, general fund. Actually, that's not the buy fund, that's the big picture again. It pretty much matches up with the revenues. Um, this is the general fund expenditures. You can see uh, public safety is the biggest part of that. Then next, you're looking at the city administration. <coughs> and uh, public works. And this is just a general fund. We do spend money for public works and parks and rec and other funds with special revenues. Special yes. This is another way of looking at the budget. Um, this is kind of based on frequently asked questions, but this is how much of that total budget is spent on salary, wages, benefits, it's the 9.5 million operating expenses that can be, you know, indispensable school contract services for the fire department. It's, it's everything else. Capital or um, building the streets, roads, pipes, uh, debt service, that's all utility debt service. And the transfers, um, our utilities say that the water sewer fund spends off some revenues from serving residents outside mm -hmm. of our city limits. And that becomes a revenue source for the general fund, which helps keep our taxes down. Um, and we provide that at some of the lowest rates. Well, it's, it's this, is, this is just an example of some of the information that you'll find in the budget book that we play with. Um, I, this isn't updated to show the new tax values that came in. Uh, the bottom red bar shows you the taxable property tax values. That's what we base, that's what we apply our millage to, that'll give us our revenues. Everything above that are exemptions, or the yellow, which I think is interesting, is the, the value that you have from the Save Our Homes cap. Where your house is worth so much, but you, it only increased taxable value at 3% a year. And you see as the economy went bad, that's the piece that shrank because you could still have an increase in your taxable value if the value of your house went down in these past few years. Um, the information that we got that just came out, I think uh, our taxable value is going to be 1.27 over the um, Of the millage that you pay, Miami Beach gets 17%. So most of your tax money is going to the city Jacksonville. Of a large piece of the school board. And the issues that I see coming up this year is um, again just trying to come up with the money to, to fund our salary and benefit package for the our employees, for the new employees, uh, so we can retain the good people that we have. Um, the revenue is slow, it is look like it's starting to come up a little bit, but it's just a little bit. And that's the taxable value. 1.275, that's four million in revenues. And if, if that stays, you know, if that becomes final, that's about uh, six percent. Coming up this year, public safety building. We also have in design right now a Seminole Road Street project, which is a pretty major project. Um, 
they want to put in sidewalks, change the to look for the road, and we're also having a utility company go in and place some, some infrastructure on the road like that, so they're only doing it both at the same time. Um, sanitation and tipping fees, this has been going on for three years now. Um, the meeting that I just had last week with uh, Jacksonville, um, Gulliford agreed with Jacksonville staff that we would go into mediation on that. Uh, I think the Land Beach has a really good case to have it. Um, pretty low, but that's my optimism. Um, annexation, for those of you that are familiar with the Land Beach, Southern Land Country Club is being rebuilt. It's not Land Beach Country Club. They are under construction now, and at the same time, we've been talking to Jacksonville about trying to get there with us accident into the Bank Beach. Um, they uh, go from again to the same meeting, got a commitment from Jacksonville that they would have some legislation <coughs> on that. So we'll wait and see if they come through on that as well. Big expenses this year, we're looking at um, taking another step in some computer software upgrades. So you've been using the, the same system for probably 20 years and uh, at least 15 or 16 since I've been there. And we're looking to get to a Windows-based environment for all of our reporting. Um, we also have an ancient phone system that's analog that we want to go digital. And we're going to try to integrate that this year. And um, there's also some police uh, software, the system that they use to track crimes and calls and all that. We need to upgrade that as well. We also plan to do some park improvements. Russell Park hasn't been touched in years. Uh, we pretty much left it up to the big league baseball team to take care of it. And as a result, there's a lot of things going to be worn out. And, and it's time to play so we we'll can put some improvements there. As well as the ongoing project with our March Master Plan, um, that island, we're trying to uh, we're, we're in design now for improving the roadway out to the island. And then after that's done, we'll get some more community input and see if the next steps will be there. Another item I'll just put on the list as an issue. It's not always a budget issue, but in the age of technology and websites and presentations and uh, records requests, um, the citizens wanted to know everything that's going on. Uh, the administration is, is trying to find ways to let the citizens into our operation and see more sooner and accurate. And um, we are going to um, work on a software program that helps put the agendas together. Uh, we are now videotaping our commission meetings. That's been a, a hit. We're finding that a lot of people are calling and asking questions, and we know there wasn't people at the meeting, but they tell us they've been watching at home. It's also nice because some of the honorary citizens stay home too. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it does have the benefits to have uh, being, being uh, able to watch the public. So, it also helps too for the staff, um, communicating back to the, to the staff that doesn't come to the meetings what happened. Uh, a lot of the employees watch the meeting and they hear it for themselves what was said about their departments or their projects and stuff like that. So it really benefits us to have that circle closed to the that. I was actually not in favor of it, but I'm totally in favor of it. Um, I think Jack's speech. I, I think I agree. Right. <laughs> I agree. Mean, I read that over a year ago. I'm giving them the new beach, okay? Budget workshops are the 13th and the 20th this year. Tentative um, adoption September 8th. The final knowledge and budget September 22nd. We will post the proposed budget on the website before the workshop. Sure. Okay. Uh, 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 u
It's a big deal. I mean, right now, uh, you know, I'm very concerned about the 4th of July. We have massive logistical planning for the 4th of July. We're coordinating with Neptune Beach. We have in the past, but here it has to be even do a better job this year. So we're coordinating with that. We're going to have tens of thousands of people there for the 4th of July. Setting up the fireworks is a big deal. And then after the fireworks, everybody's going to complain to me, those tens of thousands of people, how come they can't just get on the street and drive right out of here with no problem? How come there's a traffic jam? Well, you figure it out. And then, of course, we've got those thousands of bikers, people on bikes, of which, by the way, don't, don't, let's keep this confidential. One of them's going to be me. <laughs> the takeover of the world can't get anywhere. And so, and if you're going to the fireworks in Jack's Beach, you might want to wait about 30 minutes before you try and get out of there because there's not, there's no way to get those tens of thousands of people out of there, out of there fast after the fireworks. But let me point it out, I'm joking, but I'm also very serious. This is a huge big deal for us. We have huge crowds. Uh, every weekend if there's good weather and keeping track of that, keeping the police, keeping the trash picked up, making sure nobody drowns, it's a big deal. It's not a big deal. Uh, we're also always concerned about we're going to talk about some more wages, pensions, health insurance. Uh, we're doing very well on that right now. We just we got pension reform with all three of our unions, police, fire, and general reporting. I think we've solved that problem for now. When I say for now, it's not like 20 years ago when you hit the pension plan and it was supposed to be 100% funding and you walked away and didn't worry about it. Those days are long gone. We have to keep an eye on it at all times. Cost of infrastructure needs replacement. Do you guys know Plant Sharp? Farm Mayor Sharp? I used to drive nuts with this. You know, I say, okay, you look at the city, you look at all the water sewer systems, everything. Did you know every single thing that we own today is going to fail someday and have to be replaced? You just get find a heart attack. <laughs> anyway, it's true. Everything we own, everything we have, every street, every water source system, every manhole has got to be maintained and has got to be replaced someday. That's a big deal. Um, and this is one, I want to talk about this more slowly. Of course, hurricanes, major catastrophes, I know we're all a little bit complacent because we haven't even had a big tropical storm for several years, but when we do, the beaches, the beaches, the beaches the cities all have to get together, to get together and make sure that things are taken care of as best as we can. And I'm always concerned about reduced federal funding for shore protection. That's not a problem right now that I'm aware of. Jackson Beach and Atlantic Beach. Uh, actually, Jackson Beach has taken the lead for this for probably the last five years, but Atlantic Beach also uh, probably took the lead on some of the beach renourishments before that. But you know, we don't just call, get on the phone and call 1 800 shore protection, which is the appropriate word, it's Jackie reminds me, shore protection. <laughs> you know, we've got to make sure the funds are budgeted for that at the state level. There's a state share. We have to make sure the funds are budgeted at the federal level and get an Obama's budget, which is a lot of difficulty. And then we have to get the local share with the Jackson pay. So all those things have to come together at the same time. The money's got to be there for the court to do the work. It's not a, it's not a guarantee. There's no guarantee to get the money. So we work real hard to get those money and get a lot of help from the so one, one difference in Jackson Beach is redevelopment. We have a downtown and a South Beach redevelopment area. I just want to remind you, over the past 20 years, we have totally rebuilt our downtown and totally rebuilt the south end of the city. Um, we're not the same city we were 20 years ago. Almost all the improvements, all, all the buildings on this map were due by redevelopment efforts. Um, and we totally changed it to a beautiful, beautiful downtown we have today. Um, also, I just want to put up for a second, um, that we also have, uh, you know, we, we, we've been criticized, I think, recently. People say, well, you just focus on the downtown with improvements in one place else. Well, that's, that's, that's really not true. Um, right now, in the downtown redevelopment area, our next big project, we have some small ones, but our next big project is we're going to be uh, rebuilding First and Second Streets from Beach Avenue to 16th Avenue South. It's going to be a big, big multi-year project that we're planning on right now. So the council feels that we've done a lot for the downtown. We need to get out of that area and start straightening out some other areas too. And on the south, side, the south end of the city, you may not be aware of this, but virtually in the south end of the city, virtually everything, I if I get this right, everything west of A1A and south of Osceola was done through the city's redevelopment efforts. That includes Jacksonville Drive, South Beach Parkway, Osceola. It includes Riptide. It includes. Uh, Ocean K, it includes Paradise Key, uh, it includes three shopping centers. Um, all that was done through Jackson Beach redevelopment efforts. So we also totally rebuilt the south side of the city. Our last redevelopment effort, ironically, was out of the redevelopment district was Avalon. 
Everybody knows all that new construction you see now on A1A, uh, right around the Butler Boulevard Bridge, that new subdivision. That was done through the city's redevelopment efforts. We had a very innovative project where we had a 1920 subdivision. The city worked with the 63 or so property owners. We, we built the streets, water sewer systems, drainage. We assessed the properties for it. We told the property owners that they had to repay it. We charged them 8% interest. You have to pay it back within four years, and guess what? This is, I've never seen this before. Uh, every single assessment's been paid on every single lot. And people are building a half million dollar homes on A1A. So, you know, go figure, they're nice homes, but, uh, but uh, I'm very proud that we were able to turn what was basically an unofficial homeless center into a red line subdivision. Utilities, well, this, is, this is one thing that bugs all city officials out of sight, out of mind. I mean, let's face it, it's underground, water lines, sewer lines, you know, sewer plants, you don't see them, uh, so you don't think about them, and when you, uh, I'm not trying to be funny, you know, when you, when you flush the toilet, when you turn on the water, it's all there, you don't worry about it, there's a lot to worry about when you're in a job like uh, Nelson's Mine areas. Um, this gets me to be a more interesting part of the question, we're talking about things because enterprise funds, uh, these are intended to be self-supporting electric. Next, the city of Jackson Beach a few years ago put in a natural gas system for our commercial customers. Water and sewer, which you discussed. Storm water, garbage. We have a golf course. We have leased facilities, but that means we have an industrial park property that we lease out. We also lease property for a cell, cell phone tower site. Uh, lease properties is a real big deal in our city. We have two cemeteries. Um, so when you talk about the utilities or uh, or the uh, enterprise funds. They concern me. I know, you know, I get, I get calls from businessmen, people time to time about, you know, you have a horrible sign code, or I can't do this in zoning. And I'm sure that sometimes those things are correct, but you're going to try and deal with the federal government on their regulations. Stop us. You're, we don't regulate anybody the way that we're regulated in so many fields. But, you know, we, uh, we also we have more important federal and state regulations on water, sewer, and stormwater. They're not done on sewer, they're not done on stormwater. We had the big meeting on the law on the uh, river, the St. John's River Court, and everybody was, was, you know, patting himself on the back, and this is a great thing. The only thing that went through my mind is Nelson has cash register. So the first thing I did is I ran over to Jackie and Andrew and I said, Do you want to give me some money for these great new improvements? So, uh, so they all be paid for it. And I do want to make this real clear. You know, we all we talked about quality of life, we talked about clean water. I don't mind spending more money to make sure the St. John's River is clean and we have a clean environment. The problem is where do you draw the line? You know, I mean, um, and the problem is how clean is clean. I know that sounds sarcastic, it's not meant to be. And so it's, it's really true. You know, if you can clean up 99% of whatever you have, say phosphorus, for a million dollars, and you do 99.5% will cost a hundred million dollars. I mean, at some point there's got to be some cost benefit to me in some of these regulations. But, um, but this is a big deal. There's going to be more sewer. The biggest ones in all the beach communities, at least Jack's Beach and Nectar Beach, are going to be more stormwater. There's going to be many, many more stormwater. Uh, we have to treat stormwater nowadays, by the way. And there's going to be many, many more things coming out of the pipeline stormwater. Uh, we also have we have to make sure our wellness, water sources, some stormwater drainage is kind of shaped at all times. Um, electric system, we've got uh, the National Energy Reliability Council. They frankly drive us a little bit crazy. It features energy. They've got 80 standards we have to meet, and they're coming up with new standards all the time. So that always keeps us on our toes. And, uh, and that's just uncertain about the cost of future electric utility regulation and coming changes to the industry. Can anybody tell me what the energy policy of the United States is? Mm -hmm. I can't. Exactly. You know, so it makes it very hard to try and predict the future and what type of resources we should be in the future. I will say this very briefly. I believe the entire electric in industry is going to be, uh, be a revolution in the next 30 years in how we deliver power and how you get into your homes. And I, I'm concerned about that and I really better be trying to keep up with everything. Um, this should give you some cause for pause about what I'm talking about. It's got to be maintained. It's just to be 85 miles of soybean. 1,990 manholes, 873 fire rounds, 2,652 water mass, 38 sewers, pump stations, 4.5 milligrams per day. Per day, that's actually should be, that should be sewer. Right? So anyway, what's a sewage pump station? Anybody know what that is? There's 38 in Jack's Beach, and they've got an Neptune Beach, and the Neptune Beach also. Well, what that does is when you, when, uh, when you have a sewage pump station, you know, when the sewage gets in the sewage lines, well, what that does is when you, when, uh, when the sewage gets in the sewage lines, 
It's got, to, it's got to be able to get to the sewer plant. Well, unless all your houses are uphill from the sewer plant, it can't gravity flow to the sewer plant. So we have 38 basically pump stations that pump the water uphill to get it to the waste treatment plant. What happens if one of those fails? <laughs> what happens? Seriously, back, the sewage backs up, doesn't it? And it could back up, and it's actually happened, it could back up into your house or into your business or whatever. So those 38 sewer lift stations, like a lot of you, happy one, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, every day of the year. Uh, if they're not, we have a lot that are in trouble. The city of Jackson Beach has fallen behind in some areas. I'm not, I'm not proud to say it. Uh, we got behind in a water bail um, exercising the checks. We've got a more aggressive program we replacing the water valves. That's a problem. We have a bigger problem right now is we've done a great job in our sewer lift stations and our plants. But our manholes, we have 1,909 manholes. All those manholes are being eaten up, some better than others, by what? Uh, so our track. Oh, by what? Our track. Salt? Salt? Hydrogen sulfide. You know, when sewage turns septic, it gives off a oh, very big yeah. gas. Yeah. 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 It's called um, hydrogen sulfide. Yeah. And so it, it eats up the line, it eats up your manholes. And in some areas, especially by those sewer lift stations where there's like a splash effect and it goes into, mm -hmm. into the stations, it can, it can get up, give off a lot more gas. And we've actually had in a couple areas in the past year whole streets caving in because you know, the manhole failed, the pipes failed, we're all leaving up by the gas, the street falls in. Again, when you're just driving down the street, you don't notice it until it collapses. <laughs> so that's not a good thing. I'm actually, uh, um, you know, I'm actually, as your city manager, I'm very ashamed of that. It shows that I wasn't doing a good enough job on the maintenance. And right now, we're, we've got to lift up, we've got to go. And over the next several years, we're going to go and lift every single manhole in the city and double check out the, the manhole system. And uh, we're going to have to do a much better job. In the next year's budget, we have $200,000 for manual repairs. I mean, it's probably not enough, but we're going to have to spend at least that amount every year until we get a really good inventory of what the problem is, and we have to work on it you know, for the last to do a better job. But again, you don't see this stuff. I mean, you know, it's under the road, you worry about it, you, and there is a lot there to be. There's a lot there as a city official we have to know and be concerned about. It, um, it may not be sexy to you, but it's sexy to me. Um, road sidewalks and drainage, again, big deal. A lot of things to worry about there. I'm not sure this number is accurate on drainage channels. You can tell you we're great job checking this about 5 o'clock tonight. But uh, drain, we all have drainage channels, we all have uh, stormwater force mains, we all have gravity veins. And again, all these things we have to, we have to maintain at all times. Um, general fund, I, I, I really didn't want to talk that much about the general fund tonight. I think Nelson did a good job on it. But just to real quickly, um, the general fund is our primary operating fund, as opposed to the enterprise fund we just talked about. We'll talk about police, fire, first responder services. And almost any city, police and fire are going to be the biggest thing in the budget. For Jack Beach, police and fire together are about 60% of the general fund. Of course, street maintenance is in the general fund, parks and recreation. Planning to build and spend enforcement, those are some of the major uh, general fund services. Where the money comes from, I don't know how well you can see this, but as Nelson said, as Harriet said, you know, about 40% of our city comes from ad hoc taxes, about 24% is transferred from other funds to rate return from Ditches Energy and local option gas tax. Uh, the money from other agencies is primarily the state sales tax, a percent that we get based on population. License and permit is about 8% taxes. Communications taxes, that's another 9%. Um, when you look at property taxes and next year's budget, by the way, I have to be real touchy talking about next year's budget and numbers. These numbers are all preliminary. But I also have two bosses in the audience that haven't seen anything about the budget presentation. <laughs> so here with you, they haven't seen it yet. I have to be, I have to tap dance a little bit around here. So, uh, but anyway, you can see it on this chart even with the property tax money that's coming in 2015, you know, even though as a whole, our, uh, our assessed value is going up around 6%. We're still getting less money. Nelson pointed that's out than we did in 2010. Um, although I will say this, I should, but I will go ahead and say this. I would project in Jacks Beach that we're going to see a slight uh, millage decrease in Jackson Beach. And I have to say that because Janelle's here. And believe me, she'll be on if I don't. Um, <laughs> Uh, just tell the truth, you know. This is a true decision. That's true. That's true. Uh, the, uh, this is real important. Nelson pointed this out. I want to hammer this home. 
You know, everybody gets their tax bill, and I honestly think that most citizens, not all, I think most citizens, it's all that money goes to Jack's Beach. If it was, I'd be very happy, <laughs> but it doesn't. The tax bill you pay, most important side, we only get about 20%. Nelson said like 19%, I think. This is, and you know, it's around 20%. You know, so, so, you know, so, again, your property taxes, what, what we get of the property taxes, we get very little. Most of it goes to the school board in the city of Jacksonville. The city of Jacksonville, you know, they're in a real pickle over their pension, and they may be having some more taxes to take care of that. So. Where the money goes, again, uh, we talk about police and fire, that's the vast majority of the money in general fund. And it divorces everything else. Uh, we have public works, parks and rec, planning development, and non departmental. Non departmental includes things like our insurances, property insurance, lot related insurance. It also includes transfers of money from street projects. And uh, life health and dental insurance funds, I talked about concerns about that. I don't know what the long term effect of Obamacare is going to be on us. I do know that the, actually this looks a lot better than your pensions did for a long time. But this gives you what, what our all funds cost of life, health, and dental insurance have been. And they have risen and will continue to rise, in my opinion. You know, the projections I see is that health insurance will continue to rise somewhere around 8% a year. I think that's not true, but that's what I don't believe. And so it's a concern. Our pension funds, I told you they pension reform. Actually, our costs went up at uh, one point from about 50000 a year to 2.9 million this year uh, with your pension reform we reduced the cost by about a million dollars in life so that's a huge difference we reduced the amount of monies of total payroll we have to pay to let's just say increase the fire pensions from the 22 percent area to around 10 percent so i'm very happy with the way we're going to work things out with our unions and uh, yeah. so the, the point i'm going to get back to though
And we also have another one that's been announced here recently, uh, Beaches Methodist Church is going to be sponsoring one as well in August. So we do use a lot of volunteers and uh, coordination with Jacksonville and keep Jacksonville beautiful. Let me know if you need more. Okay. We don't, none of the three, I'm speaking correctly, correct me, none of the three BTs have a sole grant writer person. But you know, grants aren't a sure thing. First off, you have to match your needs with the grant. And second off, you've got to, you've got to follow whatever regulations there are. So in Jackson Beach's case, we've gotten a tremendous amount of monies and even grants, but through different state programs, you know. We got $11 million from our, from our, uh, our waste treatment plant that we rebuild uh, from various state grants. Mostly, uh, so that's mostly how we pursued state and federal monies. Andrew actually underestimated the amount of money he's got for us. He said it happened, and it's been about $1.5 million we've gotten uh, with help from Andrew Crenshaw. And, and uh, that's just in money for Jack's Beach, not kind of beach reversion. So, no, it's, to me, it's not, to me, it's, honestly, it's not a big priority to me because if you have a grant, you've got, it's got to be a mission that you want to take. And I don't believe in being mission driven by grants, I'm mission driven by our. Well, our main priorities. But if there are a grant there, you know, if there's a grant there that could help us, sure. But uh, but uh, that's usually few and far between. Uh, George, let, let's blow him out of his chair. But I was really impressed when they had the stimulus money, millions of dollars. You had to have shovel-ready projects. Right. They had Ninth Street already designed, and that yeah, whole improvement to Ninth Street. We have four million for that. Oh, it's just four million. What nine? Yeah, but it was. A lot of money. $4 million. Yeah. yeah it's $4 million. Jack Smith is very aggressive in getting federal and state money for projects. We've been very, very successful in getting huge money. And even the beach renourishment, which all three cities help at, that's a big deal. That's a beach renourishment, by the way. Gosh, would you kick me every time I say short protection? Short protection. <laughs> so then that's projected to be a $15 million project. Guess what? Our, our taxpayers don't have to pay a dime for it. So that's a huge deal. Please grant us your question. Uh, do you have anything allocated to, to uh, maintain the dunes to improve the sand dunes? Uh, as you and I have discussed before, Mark, if you want to maintain the dunes, the best thing to do is to get a permit. We, we used to have no dunes here. Anybody can remember we had no dunes? We used to have a, um, a bulkhead no dunes at all. We started the shore protection, we started doing the sand fencing. The best way to get your dunes where you live higher is to put in the sand fencing. I know I've had Kevin Bodge talk to you about that and some of the potential. Well, what's Harriet doing about that? In one of our meetings, she was really excited about trying to do something. You know, the lady brought up a question when the mayor's talked in January. And you were going to do something or try to do something. Were you able to do it? Well, um, we met, um, and then our, one, of the, one of our staff people, our public, our public works director, met with a, a group of, of people. And the conclusion with all three beaches was one thing that we need, we need some signs that say, yeah, protect them. right, yeah. and we have not gotten them yet, but we have not, um, Mr. Jarbo is supposed to be working on, on securing some. Um, we have roughly 20 streets in that to be 20 crossovers, and, and we need them, I think. We, we, we all came to the same conclusion that it would 
we bring, draw awareness to number one, keep off the dunes. Yeah. And I think that definitely is an issue, and, and mm -hmm. that's where we're going there. And, and here I think on that too, I think the walkovers, you know, we, right now, that's another thing, Jackson Beach is enough, you know, we built those walkovers. We actually got about a $500,000 grant, as I recall, to build the walkovers in Jack's Beach. And uh, now we have to maintain them, though. Now we have, we're actually in the process over the next two to four years of rebuilding every single one of them because they've been out there for a decade and they're falling apart and we're and obviously we're rebuilding one of them now. But I think this, the, the, the walkovers are a critical thing and we put ours in again, that's about 10 years ago. And to me, I'm not as, I'm not as optimistic as Harry on the signs because I think the same people that don't want to read the signs to put a tag for you are the same ones who are just going to walk where they're going to walk. I think the, the having, and Harry's got some really beautiful ones, I think having the, to make it as easy as you can for people to use a walkovers is, is critical, more critical to me because I it's just like, you know, do you have to tell anybody not to leave your trash on the beach? Put a trash on I guess so. And, uh, and that's a major <coughs> key to mind. Let me respond. Uh, talking about the crossovers, I had mentioned Mr. Jarbo this week. Um, I've gone down several of our, of our crossovers in the last two weeks, and I told him, I said, our crossovers are in bad shape. I did not realize how bad a shape some of them were. And as much as I wanted to vision and try to get a bathroom, public facility put in, in a town center, um, I think because we're so small and we're so limited on resources, I'm, I told him, I said, I think now we're gonna, we really should concentrate on these crossovers because thousands walk over those, those crossovers. And at times like July, July 4th, they will be packed oh, absolutely. with people absolutely. standing on them at one time. So that's that's become a priority in that time. Well, you know, because of some of your concerns, I'm going to be down there on the first street of Neptune Beach this year. So, <laughs> so the, the uh, great thing about, the, uh, uh, about having, uh, uh, about not repairing the dunes, is you don't need walkovers. They just walk right through the, right through the dune. And these cuts have been made for the storm sewer. I mean, the storm water overflow. And in some cases, the storm water has been rerouted. But we still have this open, open thing. I don't know anywhere. And you don't need to walk over, you just walk I don't, right I don't, know, I don't know anywhere at this time where we don't need some of those cuts that we have. And as you and I have discussed, you know, one of the things we're looking at is potentially if we get the drainage problem, we work with the state on solving the drainage problem north A1A, we might be able to, to, to do a better job in that. That's a long term, <laughs> very long term thing that's not going to happen overnight. But what you can do now if you want to address the area behind the condo is you can put in sand fencing and that'll help that particular area. Yeah, uh, I agree with you about the trash and stuff on the beach and stuff. Do you think that we could get some recycling bins also down on the beach to, to maybe help out with some of that? Yeah, I, I, right now, no. Maybe some longer term. But right now, no. I mean, I, let me just give an example of logistics. One of the concerns I have this weekend coming up, 4th of July, is we're going to somehow have to find a way, you know, I challenge ourselves to find a way because in the past what I've seen, and it's been, it's been a few years since I've been on the beaches. It gets so crowded that, you know, at 5 o'clock, all the trash cans are on the floor. In this particular case, that's not a typical case I'm talking about. So we're adding a ton of trash cans on the beach. Why don't we just go pick it up in the afternoon? Because it's so crowded, there's no way to get down there. You know, there's no way to get a, the tractor and the two down there to dump it. So the logistics are heavy. But again, my big concern right now, this could change in the future, isn't recycling on the beach. For God's sake, just get people to pick their stuff up and put it in a can. I really think, I know the Chamber's talked about having that. There's a, there's a program called a Clean Community Program, and the Chamber's discussed that maybe taking that up, and it's a program designed to, instead of tackling the problem at the wrong end, which we so some, sometimes do a lot in government, of saying they're picking up the trash after they, they do it, is to get people themselves through peer pressure and through education to not leave their trash there. And it, you know, you can be skeptical about that and say that's going to be to do it about as good as putting the signs on mm -hmm. uh, on the dunes, but I think it's actually got some potential. Maybe maybe something like that, but here it's I think we had that just to educate people. I think a lot of people really don't understand why, you know, the importance of the dunes, but I think everybody should understand why you put trash on the beach that can rush out with the tides. And all the beach cities spend a tremendous amount of time. But, you know, we, I'm very I'm very proud that Jacksonville looks so clean all the time, our streets and everything. 
I agree the beach can look real trashy late in the day, and uh, my concern about that is again we can only we can only pick up that trash once a day and pick it up every morning, but uh, through the rest of the day if they don't put it in the can, it's going to stay. And that bothers me a lot. Janelle, you know, yes, to address that, the chamber is doing a Fourth of July cleanup this year. It will start, I think, about four o'clock, three or four o'clock in the afternoon, and they would like for anybody that can to. Uh, adopt a block or wherever that's close to your house and pick up the trash and uh, the, the thought behind it is there's a big cleanup on July the 5th but July the 4th is when all the trash is there the tide comes in washes all of the plastic and the garbage out of the ocean so they're trying to get it before the, the tide comes in and washes it all out to the city so anybody would like to be involved in that uh, call the chamber, John Miller's office, he's an attorney, South Jacks Beach, 241-1113 is his number if anybody would like to get involved and call him tomorrow and to volunteer. Mayor Fruit? Yes. Maybe instead of signs, you'd be better off keeping people off the dunes with some concertina wire. How about saying Well, now, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. When we're out on out on the news a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were laughing about it, and I, I, I guess I shouldn't say this publicly, but I'm going to. You know, there's snakes out there in those in those dunes. Mm -hmm. Not in Jacksonville Beach. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I should put a sign up that says, "Watch out for those snakes." <laughs> That's a good idea. Huh? I mean, that's the right Watch out, cobras. <laughs> But, but people ask people like you, well, why can't we do this and why can't we do that and let's just go out and buy this and buy that. And in Neptune Beach, the little things, like trash cans, in Neptune Beach, our budget is so small and we are so tightly funded that we really, really have to stretch to be able to do what we do. Um, I wish we did have more money and the, really the only way to really bring in more money would be to raise taxes and nobody wants to do that. I was actually going to mention the five foot rat snake that was in Jack's Beach. I'd like to have a look what that rat came from. That two beaches. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay, so oh yes. I just want to make a quick statement. Uh, you're probably aware of this, but I'm going to state it anyway. It's the obvious. George and uh, Nelson and. Jim Jarbo manage tremendous amounts of detail. We do a tremendous job for our area. And I'm exceptionally grateful to have George as our city manager does a tremendous job. But uh, all the hard work that you want on every day is a result of their efforts. So uh, my congratulations to them. Thank you. And I just like to add with your permission, can I put your presentations on the Beaches Watch website? If you would contact my agent. <laughs> I'll be putting those on the website so you'll be able to see the information. And you'll get with Mr. Jarbo. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Have a great